Good morning. Good morning. We're going to start our service of worship. If you would make your way to your seats and get ready to praise the Lord with your voices, that would be wonderful. Good to see you, um, see all of you all here. Happy to have you all worshiping with us who are online. We're going to start off with an old song this morning, talking about how we woke up with our minds stayed on Jesus. And even if you didn't, it's not too late to get your mind stayed on Jesus. Amen. All right? Amen. All right. Good morning. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on the Lord. I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Are you walking and talking with your mind? Stayed on Jesus. Are you walking and talking with your mind? Stayed on the Lord. Are you walking and talking with your mind? Stayed on Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Now we're singing and praying with our minds. Stay on Jesus. Now we're singing and praying with our minds. Stay on the Lord. We're singing and praying with our minds. Stay on Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. One more time. We're singing and praying with our minds. Stay on Jesus. We're singing and praying with our minds. Stay on the Lord. We're singing and praying with our minds. Stay on Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Isaiah 26, 3 says, he will keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And this is a peace that the world didn't give. So guess what? The world can't take it away. And why is that? Because this is from Jesus himself. He is our peace. And for those who may not know him, that offer of peace is extended to you all today. You all may be seated. Good morning and welcome ARC and to our visitors. I'm Pastor Dennis, one of four pastors here at Anacostia River Church. And on behalf of the elders, we welcome you. So if you are a visitor, if you are not a member of Anacostia River Church, at this time, we just ask that you would stand. We just want to recognize you and acknowledge your presence. Amen. Welcome, 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 welcome. You all may be seated. ARC, just take note after service, we're going to just meet and greet our visitors. So just a couple of house cleaning um, notes for um, our members, just a reminder and for our visitors that may not know, um, outside of this auditorium and to your left, you will find both men and women's restroom right past the usher table. And the usher table is also um, there with um, people who are there to meet and greet you, but they're also there to provide things like hand sanitizer or masks. So for those that may not know, masks are required while we are in this building and also in this auditorium just so that we can follow safety and building protocols. We just ask that you all would adhere to that. So again, restrooms, out the auditorium, to your left. Greeters have masks, hand sanitizers, and those are requirements for while you are in this building. Amen? All right, so to our announcements, we would look on page 13. All right, we have this Thursday, we have our members meeting. 
and that is going to take place this Thursday, October 21st at 7 p.m. We'll be meeting at Capitol Hill Baptist Church, which is located at 525 A Street, Northeast D.C. So all are encouraged. All members are encouraged to come and attend. However, if you do have some uh, concerns, uh, health concerns, or what have you, there will be a virtual option. So if you need those credentials, please see Abby after service to receive those. So the elders, we have a number of baptisms that we're going to celebrate during that time. Praise God. Amen. We have a, a deacon nomination that we want to bring before you. Um, so please be in prayer as we lead up to that time. Amen. And the following day on Friday, October 22nd at 630, we have a new member's orientation. This is just an opportunity for you all who would like to join the church to come and hear about our five M's, learn about our church covenant, and hear our statement of faith. So even if you are a member and you want a refresher, you're also more than welcome to come as well. This is kind of the first step that you take in joining the church. So again, October 22nd, 6.30 via Zoom. So if you need those credentials, again, you can see Abby or email her at admin at anacostiariverchurch.org. And lastly, Coffee and Convo, our outreach that we do every Monday will be taking place tomorrow at 815. We meet at the church office. That's over at 1606 17th Street, Southeast D.C. We gather for a time of prayer, and then we hit the block about 830, usually out there for about an hour. So you all are more than welcome. If you have any questions about Coffee and Convo, you can see myself or Ashley. All right. Are there any other announcements that I might be missing? We have brother Tommy. All right, come on up, Tommy. Y'all welcome him as he comes. Okay. Good morning, church. Uh, this is I'm Thomas Matthews. I'm Christian Gibbons. Um, triad group leaders asked us to kind of give us our testimony on um, how our triad group has been, how it's blessed our lives. So um, I'll let Christian start first. And... All right. So um, honestly, the triad group was a pleasant surprise to me. Um, I was nervous when they were like, oh, we're going to put you guys in groups of three. And I was like, oh, Lord, who am I going to be paired with? Uh, <laughs> um, and to my surprise, I really didn't get to know Tommy until our triad group. Um, but it's been a really wonderful time getting to know this brother and Daquan um, Weldon. If you guys don't know him, he's one of the newlyweds in the church. I'm him and Kayla. Um, and it's been a wonderful time just to get to know the two of them. Um, we all kind of hit it off because we like tennis. Um, we haven't been out in a minute, but uh, we got to get out there. Um, and we just have a good time right now. We're going through um, Randy Alcorn's book, uh, Money's Possession and Eternity. And it's been a blessing to me. Um, we've all been challenging each other and how we view money um, and how we are good stewards, what God has given us and how we want to pour into this community um, and pour into each other's lives. So it's been a great time. I'm thankful for these brothers. And yeah. Yeah, and uh, similar to Christian, um, I was kind of nervous on uh, one leading the tribe group or being a facilitator. Um, but this group has uh, been a lot, meant a lot to me. Um, they've helped me think through some decisions. Um, they've kind of prayed for me. I think this is one of the, I mean, I've had people pray for me, but these guys are always looking to pray. Um, so they've been very encouraging in that way. Um, they, I mean, just thoughtful, um, good Christian brothers. They exhort me to um, think about the things of the Lord. And so, um, yeah, this group has just been a great benefit to me. Um, these guys, like, we've grown close, like sports. Um, and like Christian said, I didn't know Christian prior to this, but, I mean, we have a lot of common interests. And so um, I think these tribe groups are a great way to bring the brothers together in, um, in community and fellowship. And so, um, yeah, um, if you aren't in a triad group, uh, please plug in, talk to the uh, – triad group leaders of men's ministry, um, uh, Christian, um, uh, Brother Lloyd, Brother Durst, um, and I can't remember all the other guys, but um, yeah, there are a lot of guys that will point you in the right direction. So um, yeah, so that is our uh, testimony about a triad group. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Great time to be encouraged. So brothers, come on out and join us. Uh, if you are a member of ARC, then you want to plug into the triad group. And that way it makes this Christian journey all the more sweet. Uh, all hearts and minds clear. Let us take a moment of silence as we prepare to continue in worship.
Our scripture called the worship is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4. And it says, rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. Let me read it one more time. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 says, rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. So what matters to God is not what people look like on the outside, their clothes, their shoes, any external adornment, but it is godly character that God looks at. So my brother Esang, he's going to read 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 to 3. And as Esang reads this account of Samuel, who journeys to Bethlehem to find King Saul's replacement, notice what man pays attention to, and then also notice what God pays attention to. So 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1 to 13. Morning, ARC. Today's scripture is as follows. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And Jesse, and invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. <clears throat> the elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man sees the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he said, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. May we rise and continue worship. Yep. All right. As this thing was sharing that verse, um, it made me think about the passage that says, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And the reason that came to mind, um, I learned the context of that verse. David was being anointed that day as king. Um, and, you know, he was going through all this opposition. Um, and yet God had called him to that moment to be anointed as king. So whatever you're going through, whatever God has called you to, um, be confident in that and know that today is the day that the Lord has made. And if he has some good things planned for you, there's nothing that can thwart it. So let us carry that in our hearts as we go throughout today. Blessing and honor 
glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Blessing and honor, blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. Worship, you be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh ancient of days. From the top. Blessing and honor, glory and power be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Blessing and honor, blessing and honor, glory and power. Be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Every tongue in heaven and earth shall declare your glory. Every knee shall bow at your throne. In worship, you will be exalted, O oh God. And your kingdom shall not pass away, O oh, ancient of days. Your kingdom. your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Lead to the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing unto the ancient of days. Your kingdom shall reign over all the earth. Sing unto the ancient of days. For none can compare to your matchless worth. Sing unto the ancient of days. Every song. Every song in heaven and earth shall declare your glory every knee shall bow at your throne in worship you be exalted O oh god and your kingdom shall not pass away O oh, ancient of
If the stars were made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've made. Every burning star is signal fire of grace. If creation sings your praises, so will I. your promise you don't speak in vain no syllable empty your voice for once you have spoken all nature and science follow the sound of your voice and as you speak a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If it all reveals your nature, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky, the canvas of your grace. If creation still obeys you, so will I. So will I. So will I. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roll your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. Good. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still fall shy, then we'll sing again a hundred billion times. If the stars are made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so will I. If the oceans roll your greatness, so will I. For if everything exists to lift you high, so will I. If the wind goes where you send it, so will I. If the rocks cry out in silence, so will I. If the sum of all our praises still fall shy, then we'll sing it again a hundred billion times. Oh. Chased down my heart, all of my failure and pride. Want to hear you created, the light of the world, abandoned in darkness, you died. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. Where you lost your life so I could find it here. 
If you left the grave behind you, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you've done. Every part designed in the work of our called love. If you gladly chose surrender, so will I. I can see your heart in a billion different ways. Every precious one, a child you died to save. If you gave your life to love them, so will I. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Sound like you would. Like you would again a hundred billion times. But what measure could amount to your desire? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Create in me a clean heart and purify me, purify me. Create in me a clean heart so I may worship thee. Create in me a clean heart and purify me. Purify me, create in me a clean heart, so I may worship thee. Cast me not, cast me not away from thy presence. Please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation. So that I may worship thee. Cast me not, cast me not away from thy presence. Please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation. So that I may worship thee. Let's sing that as a prayer created me. Create in me a clean heart and purify me, purify me. Create in me a clean heart so I may worship thee. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart and purify me. Purify me, create in me a clean heart, so I may worship thee. Cast me not, cast me not away from thy presence. Please don't take your spirit from me and restore the joy of salvation. So that I may worship thee. Cast me not. Cast me not away from thy presence. Please don't take your spirit from me. And restore the joy of salvation. So that I may worship thee. So that I. So that I may worship thee. 
so that I, so that I may worship thee, so that I, so that I may worship thee. Yeah, I mean. Please join me in humbling ourselves in our prayer confession. Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us for entertaining and harboring unrighteous thoughts. Lord, if you find within us lust, unrighteousness, anger, envy, greed, deceitfulness, please forgive us. Search us through and through and eradicate anything that displeases you. Lord, forgive us for every time we've watched news updates locally and far away about tragedy or injustice and didn't feel the need to pray, but rather remain callous to the world's needs of you. Forgive us for seeing a request from a prayer from our very own members go out and not remember them in our prayers. Forgive us for placing faith and fear instead of you. Forgive us for taking better care of our homes, but neglecting your temple, our bodies. Forgive us for not asking for you, for, from you wisdom and leaning to our own understanding. Forgive us for worshiping the created things instead of you. Forgive us for devoting more time to social media, Amazon.com, movies, music, sports, and all of our devices, then your holy word. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Help us to be in the world, but not of it. Forgive us for not doing everything in our homes, on our jobs, and in our church as unto you. If we have misrepresented you, and tainted the image of Christ to our coworkers, spouses, children, neighbors, Lord, please forgive us. If we have taken the glory for any good thing or work without re redirecting honor and praise to you, forgive us. Lord, give us a grievous heart toward our sin and that draws us nigh to you and away from ourselves. Lord, renew a right spirit within us and rekindle a passion for purity. Forgive us for engaging in aimless chatter and debates, but shrinking back on conversations of holy living and sharing the gospel out of fear of man. Lord, please have mercy on us according to your steadfast love and remember our transgressions no longer. And like your servant David, I pray that you create in us a clean heart and renew our right spirit within your people. Lord, give us a gentle and quiet spirit. Amen. Join with me as I, I read our assurance of pardon found in Psalms 103 verses 9 to 14. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Praise the Lord. And we'll continue um, in that vein and sing what a beautiful name, because he is the one that is beautiful. Um, and everything we just heard affirms that. He forgives our transgressions and remembers them no more. You are the word 
at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high, your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ, what a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ. Your hidden glory us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Sin was great. My sin was great. Your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name of love, all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ. Death could not hold you, the veil torn before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. And you have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. And yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, 
nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of what a beautiful what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You have no rival. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. Yours is the name above all names. Yours is the name above all names. Yours is the name Yours is the name above all names. Beautiful name, yours is the name of all names. Yours is the most holy name. Yours is the only name that saves. Yours is the only name that heals. You are the only wise king. You are the name above all names. Jesus. Amen. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, God, for the ability to come together um, in the house to worship you, God. Continue to open our eyes so that we can see you more and cherish you more, God. Because you are the only thing worthy of our time, the only one worthy. And we're just so grateful that we can be here. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, beloved. How y'all doing this morning? Mm. How y'all doing this morning? Amen. Amen. Now, I want to be clear. It's okay if you're not doing all right this morning. It's all right. It's okay. God still has us. God still loves us. God still provides for us. It's one of the wonderful things about God. You come to him as you are. You don't have to perform to come into his presence. Amen? As we come into his presence now, let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name that is above every name. The name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. We come to you in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, whom you made to be a sin offering for us, whom you raised from the grave three days later for our justification, who has ascended into heaven at your right hand and intercedes for us even now, who is our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. In his name and for his glory and for our joy in him, we ask now, Father, that you would bless the preaching of your word. Not just the preaching, Father. Bless the hearing of your word. Well, we pray, take your word and press it into our hearts and shape us, change us, 
Mold us into your image and likeness more fully. For some of us, that means giving us new life this morning. So those who've come this morning dead in their sins, not yet made alive through faith in Christ, we pray that you would give them faith. And for others of us, that means, Lord, we need to hear your word and the counsel of your word in our fight of faith that we would not turn back to the world, that we would not give in to temptation and sin, that we would not falter our journey to glory. And still others of us, Lord, need not a word of correction, but a word of healing and help and comfort. Our various needs can only be met by your Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit, we pray, take, take your word, apply it to every heart, as every heart has need. Do this for the glory of Jesus and the glory of the Father. Do this for the joy of the church, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, I want to add my word of welcome. Uh, I'm Pastor T, one of the four pastors here at Anacostia River Church, we're so glad that you're here. We can't think of any place we would rather you to be than to worshiping God with us and hearing uh, from his word. Now, you, you may have picked up at the uh, guest table out back uh, a new sermon card. There's a new sermon card out. If you didn't get one on the way in, please take two on the way out. Put one in your Bible, put one at your desk where you sit most or what have you. Uh, this list the sermons for the upcoming four months, uh, so you'll know where we will be in God's word from week to week. I want to encourage you to take this and use this perhaps as part of your quiet time. Read the, the t upcoming text um, for the sermon um, each morning. Pray for the preaching of the word. Pray for the hearing of the word. Or, or take it, if, it's, if you got something else you do in your quiet time, take it and Saturday night. Use this as part of your Saturday night routine. Don't just fall asleep, right? Go to sleep with spiritual purpose. Read the text that's going to be heard on Sunday morning and ready your heart, ready your ears to hear God's word. Now, if you're visiting with us this morning, I want you to know that we are a congregation that aims to be committed to God's word. And that's because of what we believe God's word to be. Very literally, God's word. That the Bible is um, the, the, the message that God wants us to have, that he literally breathed out, that he inspired through apostles and prophets to write it down over some 1,600 years. 40 different languages, um, or 40 different authors, three different languages, excuse me. And, and this word has been preserved for us that we might hear the voice of God and that we might know God. And that's why we preach this word. That's why we want to be careful with this word because this word is life and life giving. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Esther chapter 2. We continue in our series in the book of Esther, which we started uh, two weeks ago. Last week, we were blessed to hear our brother Colin preach to us about um, the, the life in the spirit and fighting the flesh. This week and for the next few weeks, we come back to our study of the book of Esther. Now, one of the things we said last week in introduction uh, to this book is that Esther is famously um, sort of regarded as unusual in the Bible. Unusual because God is not actually mentioned by name in this book. And that's caused some people some consternation, caused some people to raise some questions, things of that sort. But as we're going to see in this text, God's hand is all over this story. It's all over this part of Israel's history. And it's learning to live in anticipation of God's invisible hand moving. That is the key to the Christian life. It's the key to living faithfully as exiles in a world that's hostile to people of faith. In other words, if you want to sort of go on with encouragement and hope, if you want to go on in perseverance, then we ought to become people who learn to expect God to move in unusual circumstances, even circumstances that at first appear quite negative to us. And that's what we're going to see when we come to Esther chapter 2. This chapter is going to take us through three scenes, and this is my outline for the sermon. Scene number one, the king decides to replace Vashti, his former queen, 
using a beauty contest. That's what we're going to see in verses 1 to 4. Number two, in scene number two, we get introduced to Mordecai and Esther. And Mordecai and Esther are caught up in this contest because Esther is beautiful. Verses 5 to 11. And in the final scene, the story resolves with Esther becoming queen by the providence of God. Esther becoming queen by the providence of God. We see that in verses 12 to 18. So look with me in Esther chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashtar. This pleased the king, and he did so. Now there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai the son of Jair, son of Shemai, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is, Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa, the citadel, in custody of Hegai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in custody of Hegai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. And every day Mordecai walked in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now when the turn came for each young woman to go in to King Ahasuerus after being 12 months under the regulations for the women, since this was the regular period of their beautifying, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with spices and ointments for women, when the young woman went in to the king in this way, she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. In the evening, she would go in. And in the morning, she would return to the second harem in custody of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the concubines. She would not go in to the king again unless the king delighted in her and she was summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his own daughter, to go in to the king, she asked for nothing except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who had charge of the women, advised. Now Esther was winning favor in the eyes of all who saw her. And when Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into his royal palace in the tenth month, which is the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign, the king loved Esther more than all the women. And she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashtar. Then the king gave a great feast for all his officials and servants. It was Esther's feast. He also granted a remission of taxes to the provinces and gave gifts with royal generosity. This is God's word. Notice the first scene. The king decides to replace Vashtar. Chapter 2 opens with the words, after these things. Now, these things, you'll remember, refer back to chapter 1. That's when King Ahasuerus had thrown this huge party in order to display his great wealth. He's king over 127 provinces, all the way from India, all the way to Ethiopia. 
And all of them are gathered together, and he is boasting about his wealth. And at one point, uh, he gets to drinking. He drinks for seven days. And at the end of the seven days, he's all tipsy. He decides he's going to show off his wife, too. And you remember, Vashti refused to come because she had dignity and, and respected herself enough not to be sort of paraded before drunken, lustful men. King gets mad, asks his advisors what they should do. One of the advisors tells him, you know what? You need to get rid of Vashti because Vashti is showing out like this with you. All the other women in the country are going to be showing out with all their husbands too. We shut this down, get you a new wife better than that one. Y'all remember that, right? And so he does that. Now, verse, verse 1 reminds us of these things. And it tells us that finally the king's anger has abated. His anger has, has calmed down. And now, look at Esther chapter 2, verse 16. In the end of this scene, we're told that it was in the 10th month, which is the month of Tebeth, which would be our December, in the seventh year of his reign. So now in chapter 1, verse 3, we, we began in the third year of his reign. Now we're in the seventh year of his reign. There's been, about, there's been four years between the events of chapter 1 and the events of chapter 2. He's been without a queen for four years. Now, historians tell us that this is the period of time where Xerxes, or Ahasuerus, had gone to war with, with Greece. He sought to conquer Greece and, and, and Rome, excuse me, and, and, and he lost that war. If you've seen the, the movie 300, you've seen a depiction of that, of that battle, of that fight. He comes back. He's mad because he ain't got no wife. He's mad because he done lost the war. He finally calms down, and he tries to figure out what he should do. Notice now. He thinks about what she had done, Esther. And he thinks about what had been decreed against her, the law that was written against her. The, the phrasing there is interesting. It seems that Ahasuerus thinks all his troubles is other people's fault. It's what Esther had done, not, not what he did in his drunkenness. It's what had been, or excuse me, Vashti, what Vashti had done Let's see, help me. Get your good help me, brothers. It's what Vashti had done, not what he had done in his drunkenness. And it's what that, 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 that advisor had advised and was decreed, not the law that he passed. So this passive tense makes it seem like this ain't my fault. Woe is me. Everything is being done against me. And you start to get a picture of this king. He's given to anger. He's easily influenced. And nothing's ever really his fault. Some commentators tell us that after chapter 1, that Ahasuerus or Xerxes might have had those seven advisors beheaded. We don't know that for sure, but they don't appear in the rest of this book. Notice now what, who he's surrounded with. He's surrounded, verse 2, with young men who attended him. So he's going from the seven princes of the Medo-Persian Empire as his advisors and the only ones who saw his face in chapter 1 to now being surrounded by seven young men, seven young cats who are his attendants and friends. He's going from taking advice from princes to taking advice from servants. Now, it might be helpful to remember what the Bible generally says about youth and youthfulness. It's not flattering that most often the Bible will present youth and youthfulness as foolish, as lacking in wisdom. Uh, a young man being praised for wisdom happens in the Bible, but it's a, it's a rarity, really. And here this king is taking advice from, from the young people that surround him. And you might remember King uh, Rehoboam of Israel in 2 Chronicles 10. Anybody remember that story? The young guy, he becomes king. And, and he, he, he calls together the elders of Israel, wants to know sort of what he should do as king. And the elders of Israel say, basically, your father, he was kind of harsh. You know, if you sort of lighten up on us, the people will love you and follow you all of your days. He rejects the, the counsel of the elders. And Second Chronicles 10 tells us he calls together the young, young folks that he grew up with. And he takes their counsel. And you know how young people are sometimes? None of y'all are young. I ain't talking about none of y'all, okay? But you, you know how some young people are sometimes? You know, they, they headstrong and they rash. 
And the young people said, no, I'll tell you what you do. You tell them that your little finger is thicker than your daddy's waist. That, that you think your dad was hard on them. Tell them how hard you're going to be on them. And he took the advice of, the young, of his young friends. And before the chapter ends, he's running for his life because the, re- the people rebel against him. But in 2 Chronicles 10, verse 16, we have this little sneaky line in there. It says these words about Rehoboam. Rehoboam. So the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought about by God that the Lord might fulfill his word. In other words, the Lord used the folly of Rehoboam, the folly of those young people around Rehoboam, to accomplish his purposes for Israel. The same thing is happening here with Esther. The young servants have a foolish idea. But it's an idea that in God's providence, God will use to accomplish the rescue of his people. So look at their idea in verses 2 to 4. The young men say, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa, the citadel, under custody of Higai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. So here this king is with a problem. He doesn't have a queen. Marriage with the queen is broken. Uh, It's been four years now. And how does his young friends decide to solve that problem? Let's have a beauty contest. Let's have a beauty contest. An international beauty contest. This might have been the first Miss Universe pageant. And they are specific about the eligibility, aren't they? Two times they say, let her be beautiful, let her be young, let her be a virgin. That's the emphasis. It's on appearance and age and purity. And, and just as an aside, it's, a, it's an interesting sort of quick glimpse into what's called purity culture these days. Isn't it? isn't it interesting that in purity culture, the burden for purity is shifted to women while men go on doing what men do? Right? Ahasuerus ain't young. He probably ain't cute. Right? And he ain't no virgin. But that's, that's, what, that's what happens, right? In a land where women are objectified, beauty, beauty becomes the only qualification for acceptance. Well, beauty and a willingness to accept the objectification. We must understand that in a land where women are objectified and beauty is the main or only currency that some women have, then women will only be able to cope in society by exploiting their own beauty. It's a pernicious trap. In a land where women are objectified, we must understand in oppressive systems like that, those systems insist that the oppressed comply with their own oppression. The women who are going to be gathered in this beauty contest, they're not volunteers. They're taken into it. I wish to point out once again that the Women in Esther chapter 1 and 2, from the queen on down, have no representation in the halls of power. They have no representation in government. They have no access to the king other than as a part of their harem. Their future is being determined without them. Objectification robs women of their voice and of representation as anything other than objects the backroom lawmaking of chapter 1 is combined now with the adolescent advice of chapter 2. And it combines to create a very dangerous existence for women in Esther and Vashti's time. Scene 1 ends with King Ahasuerus being pleased with this beauty contest idea. So he orders all 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia to send their most beautiful young virgins to his beauty contest to become a part of his harem. Don't forget the culture that this is happening. That brings us to the second scene where Mordecai and Esther now get caught up. They get swept up in the king's beauty contest. So we get our introduction now to the two sort of heroes that 
that, that exists throughout the rest of this book. First of all, we meet Mordecai, the cousin who loves like a father. You see, we're told five or six things about Mordecai there. Number one, verse five, he is a Jew. That's the first thing we're told because the storyteller now wants to bring that to the front. He wants to bring the, the identity and the existence and the, and the difficulty of God's people to the front so the hearers can see it very clearly. And in calling Mordecai a Jew, of course, the Bible is referring both to Mordecai's ethnicity and his religion. And in naming this first about Mordecai, we get the sense that Mordecai is faithful to both his ethnic people, and his God. Second thing we're told is that he lives in Susa, the, the capital city there of the empire. He's in the middle of where things happen. And then we're given a little bit of his genealogy in verse 5. See there, we're told that uh, he is the son of Jair, son of Shemai, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. He's able to trace his lineage back to Kish, who is the father of Saul, the first king of Israel. So he has come now from a, a royal descendancy, a royal family. He's part of the tribe of Benjamin. And verse 6, Mordecai is an exile, as is all the Jews at that time. This is how, how we know, this is how Mordecai got to Susa. Generations before him, 115 years or so before him, um, Nebuchadnezzar had conquered Jeconiah, the, uh, one of the last kings of Israel. And he led the, the king and the priestly class and the royal class into captivity in Babylon. And, 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 and Mordecai's family was a part of that group of exiles who were conquered and taken to Babylon. So he's there in Susa. He's from a family that knows how to move around power. He hasn't forgotten those lessons. He is probably using those very lessons as part of his survival technique in Babylon. Notice the next thing we're told, that Mordecai raises Esther as his own daughter. Verse 7, Esther's parents have died. We don't know how or when, but she's an orphan. And Mordecai now is recreating family for her. He not only treats her as his, as his cousin, he cares for her as his own daughter. And we see how caring and protective Mordecai is, don't we, in, in a verse like verse 11. Look there with me real quickly. Every day, Mordecai would walk in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was and what was happening to her. You get the picture of a, of a caring, generous open-hearted, thoughtful man. And we should say one last thing about Mordecai. We should say something about his name. His name actually comes from the state god of Babylon, Marduk. He's adopted this name, and it suggests, particularly when you look at verse 10, which we'll talk about in a moment, it suggests that he has understood something about Babylonian culture and how to get along in Babylonian culture. He's adopted the sort of outward naming of the culture that he might be able to protect the inward relationship that he has with God. It suggests that he might have even become an official in the Babylonian Empire. In fact, there is some archaeological evidence from around this time of a certain person who was an official accountant named Marduka. Translation, Mordecai. Could be him, could be someone different. When we meet him, what we see is a cousin who loves like a father and knows how to move as an exile in a foreign oppressive land. In the same section, we're also introduced to Hadassah, the star of the story. Hadassah is Esther's Hebrew name. That's important. The fact that we're told her Hebrew name, again, hints at the import or the importance of her true identity as a Jewish woman. It also it hints at her role in the coming resistance. See, in the Bible, names are, are very important. You think about, for example, God changing Abram's name to Abraham signifying that he would make Abraham the father of, of many nations, that through Abraham he was going to save the, the peoples of the earth. He changes his name. Or does a very similar thing with Jacob, the trickster. He changes his name to Israel. 
But at other times, we see this interaction around names, and, and we realize that it's not necessarily uh, about God's saving work in creation, that the name is reflected, but sometimes about God's people sort of resisting the, 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 the culture and the influence of the world around them. So think about the book of Daniel. In Daniel chapter 1, we're told about Belteshazzar. That's Daniel's real name. That's his Hebrew name. And we're told about the, the three Hebrew boys, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's Daniel 1, 6 and 7. What's the first thing the Babylonians do? They change Belteshazzar's name to Daniel, and they change the, the three Hebrew boys' name to Shadrach, Meshach, and that bad Negro, right? Abednego. <laughs> See, their names were in part the battlefield for resistance. Their names were this sort of battlefield on which the, the oppressive, influencing, dominant culture sought to exert itself against the, the minority conquered people who were resisting and trying to maintain a sense of identity and religious freedom. So when we're introduced to an orphan exile by her Hebrew name, Hadassah, and then told her Babylonian name, Esther, which means star, we're brought, being brought into that power dynamic between oppressor and oppressed, exile and captor. And we're given a clue to her coming role in the story. We've already mentioned that she was raised by her uncle or cousin, excuse me. Verse 7 says she had neither father nor mother. She's a young woman by the time that we meet her. We don't know exactly when her parents died, but the fact that Mordecai is given credit for raising her suggests that, that her parents died when she was quite young. And Mordecai has been the one responsible for her upbringing. So she would be facing the world, not just as a Jewish person, but also facing the world as an orphan and an adoptee. She'd have all the feelings that go with losing your parents very young and with knowing the love of a cousin who adopted her. There would be at the same time this struggle for security because of the laws, and, and this sort of thankfulness and dependence because of the adoption. She's a young woman whose place in the world probably feels very fragile to her, where belonging and separation are significant issues in her soul. Here's the next thing we're told about her. She had a pretty figure and a lovely face. See that there in verse 7? The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. So she met the qualifications for the king's beauty contest. That's why verse 8 tells us, notice, that she was taken into the king's palace and put in charge of his eunuch to prepare for the contest. That word taken is strong. It suggests that she didn't volunteer. She might have been coerced. After all, this is a law passed by the king. That's what I want us to see that society's attitude toward her body and her beauty put her in danger. It is a threat and a danger to be shapely and beautiful in a culture that only values women as objects. In a very real sense, your body and your beauty become both target and prison because of the attitudes of people around you. This is something that, that men have to try to appreciate and understand more. There are many women, many of our sisters feel a sense of inescapable vulnerability because of the way society objectifies them and makes them a target for unwanted attention. What a strange and hard existence to be encased in a form that at the same time attracts people and threatens you. So, brothers, never catcall or draw attention to a woman's body and beauty unwanted. It's threatening. And, brothers, let us be the kind of congregation that honors and protects our sisters. Let us treat them, as Paul says to Timothy, with absolute purity. Let us walk them to their cars, make sure they are safe at night. Let us check one another's attitudes and comments when they're not around. So they don't have to face it and check it when they are around. 
Let us renew our minds with the word of God so that coarse joking, as Ephesians says, has no place among us. We, we want the family of the church to be a place where women can experience uh, an unself-conscious acceptance. Where they can appear before God and appear before the family of God without having to be aware of themselves and the threat that they sometimes face in this world. Let's pray for that and work for that. Let me suggest another thing about Esther here. Verse 10. Esther was passing. Esther was passing. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Look at verse 10. Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. Now, she's obeying her cousin here, her adopted father. Mordecai, as we said, is he's probably smooth around power. He knows how to operate. He knows how to move in and out of the culture. And he's told her, don't make your identity known. Now, the fact that she's able to do that is what makes it possible for her to pass. You know what I'm talking about when I say pass? Passing is this sort of strategy for coping when you're a minority in a, in a dominant culture. It, sometimes people are able to pass for the dominant culture, even though they're not a part of the dominant culture. This was a, a big thing, for example, in African Americans. One of the strategies that African Americans has used since the time of slavery, and particularly in the 1920s and 29, the Harlem Renaissance that era, passing became a, a, a sort of big topic in thinking about how do we engage with the fact that we are minorities in a dominant culture that has segregated us and oppressed us. Nella Larson wrote a title, a novel by that title called Passing in 1929. You should read it if you're looking for something good to read. If you're not a reader, they've just made it into a movie. So in a couple of weeks, Tessa Thompson is going to play the main character in that novel, Passing. And if you ain't got no money, it'll come on Net Netflix in November. Or if you ain't comfortable going to the movies, it'll be on Netflix in November. You should see it. But attempting to pass has three possibilities. Number one, you could be successful. But number two, if you succeed, it comes at the cost of any relationship with your family and your people. It's a strategy that isolates you from the community that gave birth to you. And then number three, if you're found out, the consequences of being exposed are serious, even deadly. Right? So Esther now is in this dangerous situation where she is a minority, she is a woman, she is an orphan, she's now in the king's harem because the king objectifies women, and Mordecai is advising her, do not tell her them who you really are. So she's passing, and if she succeeds, that means she's going to be further removed from her people, and if she fails, well, we know what this king is like. You need to let that tension carry you through the rest of this book and everything else that unfolds. It explains why she says, if I perish, I perish. It explains why she calls her people to pray for her when it's time to appear before the king. Because she's been put in this soup of danger. She's swimming in this stew of peril. And everything in one sense looks like it is endangering her life. Just a couple quick lessons here, a couple things to think about, maybe talk about over lunch. First thing is this. Esther's going to win this beauty contest, as we'll see, but success does not mean safety. Success does not always mean safety. Sometimes success brings us more danger and more challenges. And that's what we're going to see with Esther. So, so don't, beloved, don't, don't idolize success. Don't lust for it. Don't, don't think that that's the solution to all of our problems. It may be to many of our problems, but it would create some problems of its own. We'll see that in Esther's life. Here's another thing. If in some way you're trying to pass and you succeed, what obligation do you have to those you leave behind? 
So maybe we're not talking about passing racially or ethnically as we see in this text. Maybe we're talking about trying to pass religiously. You're a Christian. You know you're a Christian, but your coworkers don't. And you're just trying to go along to get along. Right? So you do a little bit of what they do, but not everything they do, just so they don't discover that you are a Christian. What are the costs of that? What are the consequences of that? To your soul, to your witness, to the cause of Christ. How does Jesus regard that? When he says things like this, if you are ashamed of me before men, I'll be ashamed of you before my Father in heaven. Anybody trying to pass out there? Or this. Does our obligation to those left behind rise to the level of risking our own status and our own lives for them? When is that true? When is that necessary? That's the tension that drives the rest of this book. That's the tension that's in Esther's life and heart that she'll have to make some hard decisions about. And beloved, we're not exempted as God's people from these kinds of tensions. The question is, how are we going to resolve it? We're students in high school, and none of our friends seem to be Christians. And they they wish to do things or they talk in ways that we know would bring us shame before God or shame before our parents even. What are we going to do? We're in the college classroom, and a professor is clearly not a Christian. In fact, he seems to have made it his personal mission to try and upset the faith of other college students. What will we do? Just answer the questions the way he wants to get an A on the test? Or is something more at stake? How will we witness? It happens in the workplace. It happens in the family, beloved. That our very own brothers or sisters or our mothers or fathers, Jesus told us he came to bring a sword that would separate us between them sometimes. And when we seek to live for the Lord in obvious ways and outward ways and even sacrificial ways in ways that non-Christians don't understand and our family's not supportive, how do we graciously resolve that? What will we do? That's a question we actually want to answer before we're in those situations. So that when the situation comes out of a kind of spiritual habit, we answer the way we wish we had before it came. That's the situation Esther is in. Let's go to the third scene real quickly. Number three, Esther becomes queen by the providence of God. Verses 12 to 18 really give us the conclusion of the story. Verses 12 to 14 tell us about the preparation process for the beauty contest. Some of you brothers thought y'all were waiting a long time for your wife to get ready for church this morning. These ladies take a whole year to get ready to go before the king. Six months with this kind of perfume, six months with that kind of perfume, all of which is meant to beautify them even further so that they would would appear before the queen in their, their best foot forward, so to speak. Some commentators say this process was a year long because the king wanted to make sure that all these ladies were, in fact, virgins and, and weren't maybe pregnant with someone else's child who would then be a successor to the throne. You don't know that, but that's a, a speculation. And these women would be kept under strict guard before, during, and after appearing with the king. They'd be brought to the king. They would spend the night with the king. And the next morning, they would leave one harem led by Hegai, and then they would go to a second harem led by Shashgaz, right? And they would not appear again to the king unless he called for them by name. That's kind of the process. One woman called at a time, goes to the king, spends the night with the king, and never to be seen again in that first harem. You don't know what's happening to her. She goes to the next harem. Verse 15 to 18 tells us about Esther's turn. Esther appears before the king. And this is when we begin to see more of Esther's character we begin to see more of Esther's beauty, not just her physical beauty, but what we heard read about earlier in the service, her inner beauty. She's a wise young woman who trusts the counsel of her elders. She obeys Mordecai's instruction in verse 10. When she gets to Susa and is in the harem, she obeys um, the Haggai's instruction. 
There's something about her that curries favor, not just the fact that she's pretty, but, but, but probably because she's also very gracious. She listens to the eunuch. She takes his counsel. She trusts his direction. And there's a kind of wisdom in that, isn't it? Who, who knows the king better than the eunuch, you know, who serves the king's pleasure in this regard? And so she listens, wins favor with him in verse 15, wins favor with everybody who sees her. She's apparently a woman of excellent social graces, excellent character. And her physical beauty has not gone to her head. She seems humble. When Esther appears before the king, verse 17 says, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Verse 18 tells us the king threw a feast in Esther's honor and gave gifts and tax breaks to all the provinces. So we see the sudden rise of a young exile orphan girl all the way to the queen of the empire. This this section ends with Esther winning. And taken together, this section teaches us two things about God. It teaches us, first of all, about God's providence. Again, even though God is not mentioned in this book, not mentioned in this section, we're meant to understand that everything is happening by God's control, by God's providence. Providence is God's special care for his creation, how he acts in the world to accomplish his will. And Esther's story is a lot like Joseph's story, isn't it? Remember, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. He's taken into Egypt, and and pretty soon he wins favor with Potiphar. And he becomes the lead servant in Potiphar's home until Potiphar's wife lies on him. Then he gets thrown in prison. And pretty soon he he earns favor with the prison guard and fellow prisoners. And and it's from prison that he's brought to attention of Pharaoh. And when he interprets Pharaoh's dream by by God sort of supernaturally giving him the ability to do that, then he wins favor with Pharaoh and Joseph rises to become number two in the land of Egypt, the second most powerful man in the world next to Pharaoh. And do you know how Joseph explained that in chapter 50, 50, verse 20? He says to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good to bring salvation to all of these people. All of those things, the selling into slavery, the working for Potiphar, the going to prison, the rising to second in command, was by God's providence. And Esther is experiencing a very similar thing. Her people having been conquered generations before, brought as exiles into Babylon, losing her parents so that she's now raised by her older cousin, growing up in his home. The beauty that she has, that she didn't give herself that, God gave her that, right? The, the recognition that, that she receives from the, from the eunuch that is the, that is the king's official, that, that favor God gave her. And when she walks into the king's room and the king sees her and the king loves her, it's God's providence because God turns the hearts of kings. And he turns this pagan king's heart toward Hadassah toward Esther. So if we can imagine a narrator saying something like what Joseph says in in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, the narrator might say something like this, the king meant it for his own pleasure, but God meant it for his pleasure to save the people of Israel as exiles. It's important, beloved, that while we live as exiles and we sometimes don't hear God's voice, that we don't slip into thinking that God is not ruling, that God is not working. God is always working things together for our good. God is always in the details of our lives, even the painful details of our lives, like losing parents and being taken captive. God is at work in that to do his good pleasure to demonstrate to us his goodness, his steadfastness, his love. And circumstances may make it hard for us to see the goodness of God. That doesn't mean he's not good. It doesn't mean he's not working. 
It was God who was at work in Esther's story, his providence bringing about all of this unlikely happening. God's providence is all over this story. God's providence is all over our lives, beloved. We have to trust in him still. Here's the second thing. We learn about God's grace, don't we? Now, you, you, have to, you have to see it in contrast to the king, I think. See, the human actors in this section, they put all their emphasis on the outward appearance of man, don't they? Verse 3, the young officers stress young, beautiful virgins. Verse 4, their proposal is, is something that, that is meant to please the king. They tell him to sec, select whomever the king pleases. Literally, in the Hebrew, it says, good in the eyes of the king. Verse 7, even the narrator emphasizes Hadassah's beautiful figure and pleasing to look at. Verse 17, she won grace and favor in his sight. So everybody in this chapter, in some sense, is walking by sight, putting emphasis on the external as the grounds, as the basis for their approval. That phrasing in verse 17 is interesting to me. We're told that Esther won grace and favor in the king's sight. We have to stop and ask ourselves, what kind of grace or favor depends upon someone's appearance or performance? What kind of grace has to be won? Well, the human kind, the fallen kind, the kind of favor and grace, which is really a payment for something somebody else has done or, or, or something about their character. This grace is not that grace that we sing about in Christian hymns. This kind of grace is not that kind of grace that we get from God. Esther is receiving grace and favor from the king because Esther is beautiful. Hadassah receives grace and favor from the king because Hadassah pleases the king in, in some way, in some carnal, fallen, fleshly way. But the grace and favor we receive from God does not depend upon our appearance. It does not depend upon our performance. In fact, it cannot be won. The grace and favor we receive from God is only given, and it's given freely, and it's given without regard to who we are and what we've done. Now, oh, you need, you need to hear this. See, that was your place to say amen, to shout right there. That's okay. I'll say it again. The grace and favor we receive from God has nothing, beloved, nothing, hear this now, has nothing to do with our appearance or our performance. I'm trying to free somebody right now because I know that they took a year in this beauty contest to prepare to, to appear before the king, and some of us have been spending decades trying to get cute enough to appear before God. Some of us even who claim to believe the gospel have not deeply understood grace because we think that when we've messed up, we're no longer accepted with God. Because we think if we haven't performed the little rituals that we think make us beautiful in God's sight, that we probably shouldn't go to God right now. Here's how you know you understand grace. You understand grace because you go to God precisely because you messed up. Because, precisely because you're not lovely. Pre precisely because you have no merit, no standing, no favor to claim from God. That's when you know you understand grace. But our problem since Adam and Eve is we sin and we make fig leaves. We sin and we cover ourselves and we hide. And we wait and we long for that day when we think on our own merits we can stand before God and be accepted by him. No, beloved. The Bible said, while we were still sinners, God showed his love for us in this that Christ died for us. It's while we were sinners, while we were still sinners, while we were still unclean, while we were not perfumed but stinking in our sin, while we were ugly in our sin and, and, and not attractive to God because of our sin, it's then that God sent his son into the world to die for us. That, beloved, is grace. 
That's kindness. That's favor that is not earned. That's what we mean by grace, unmerited favor, unearned favor, undeserved favor. Don't you know that God has been kind to sinners and we do not deserve it? That's at the heart of the gospel. That's at the heart of this good news that the Bible talks about. That acceptance with God is not a matter of performance. It is a matter of God's loving kindness. And all we need to do is accept it. To believe that God proved his love by sending his son to die for our sins to take the punishment of God in our place, to believe that three days later God raised him from the grave so that we would be righteous in God's sight, and to believe that God does not require of us any special performances, any special acts of duty, any special religious ritual. All God requires of us is to see our need of him, to confess our sins, and to receive and accept the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf to follow Jesus in faith. And then all of the kingdom, the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of man, all of the kingdom becomes ours through faith in Christ. Forgiveness is ours. Love is ours. Joy is ours. Peace is ours. Mercy is ours. Purity is ours. Righteousness is ours. Mercy is ours. Adoption is ours. All that God is and all that God has becomes ours, beloved, through faith in Jesus Christ. Can you sit with that? Don't move past that too fast. All that God is and all that God has becomes yours and mine through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of it. By God's grace. Here's the question, beloved, this morning as we close. Have you received that yet? Have you received God's free offer of forgiveness and adoption, of eternal life and perfect righteousness in His sight? Have you received His free offer of grace? salvation, of escape from judgment and hell, of an eternal kingdom in heaven? Have you put your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I prayed you would this morning, that you would confess your sin and put your faith in Jesus and so live forever in his love. That offer is yours now. That offer is yours every moment of your life. But, beloved, our lives are not that very long. Do not wait. Do not harden your heart today. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and live. Live not just this earthly life, but live eternal life with God. And Christian, let us learn to drink from the cup of God's grace every day, all day. Our sins are great, but his mercy is more. His mercy endures forever. Every morning, the rite of Lamentations tells us we wake up to what? Fresh mercies, new mercies, steadfast love. You drinking from that last week? You drinking from that this morning? You drinking from that grace on Monday morning? Please do. Let's encourage each other to do so to live by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what we learn of you in Esther chapter 2. That you're God of providence. You rule creation according to your will. And you're God of grace. You have been better to us than we've been to ourselves. You have been kind to us, though we do not deserve it. And you have provided for us a kingdom. Not a perishable kingdom, 
like the kingdom Esther became queen of, but an imperishable kingdom, a, a never-ending kingdom, a never-failing kingdom in which the Son of Glory reigns. He's made that ours through faith. Lord, let this, let this understanding wash over your people. Let us shower in the acknowledgement of your grace and let us abound with hope because of your kindness. Let us live life expecting grace because that's who you are. And whether we find ourselves as exiles in this world, tempted to pass, or we find ourselves fighting a battle against the oppressive forces that come against your kingdom, wherever we are, whatever we do, let us lean into your grace, we pray. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Please join us as we sing Speechless on page nine. Um, God's providence, as Pastor T said, leaves us speechless. Um, his grace is unending, unfailing, unmerited, and undeserving. And so we're just going to sing about God's grace right now. Um, this first song is new to ARC. So if you don't know it, please be ministered to. If you know it, join us as we as we sing. Unending, but always on time. Unfailing, but never unkind. Unmerited favor is mine, undeserving, oh, but I receive your grace, Lord, your grace, oh, I need it, I receive it, I'm amazed. So amazed when I see it, I am speechless. You take my breath away. You take my breath away. Oh, unending, but always on time. Unfailing. But never unkind, unmerited favor is mine, undeserving. Oh, but I receive your grace, Lord, your grace. Oh, I need it, I receive it, I'm amazed, so amazed, when I see it, I am speechless, Lord, your grace, oh, your grace, oh, I need it, I receive it, I'm amazed, so amazed. When I see it, I am speechless. You take my breath away. You take my breath away. Oh, and you breathe life into me. I'm nothing without you. Without grace, where would I be? I'm nowhere without you, and you breathe life into me. 
I'm nothing without you. Without grace, where would I be? I'm nowhere without you. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I hear you call. But Father, you had your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw near your throne. But Father, you love me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. But Jesus, your face was set. I worked my fingers down to the bone. But nothing I did could ever atone. But Jesus, you pay my debt. By your blood, I have redemption and salvation. Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown. And you rose that I might be a new creation. I am born again by grace and grace alone. I was in darkness all of my life. I never knew the day from the night. The spirit you made me see. I thought I knew the way on my own. Head full of rocks and heart made of stone. The spirit you moved in me. At your touch, my sleeping spirit was awakened. On my darkened heart, the light of Christ has shone. Call into a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone. So I'll stand. So I stand, stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. Slay my sin. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. Reach the end. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. I will stand. So I will stand in faith by grace and grace alone. I will run the race by grace and grace alone. I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone. I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. Know very clearly that last chorus. I will stand in faith by grace and grace alone. 
even our faith has its basis in God's grace. I'll run the race by grace and grace alone. I like this part. I will slay or kill my sin by grace and grace alone. Praise God that, that his grace is a, a knife that pierces sin. And I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. This is why we want the air we breathe to be grace. So I pray this week that as we go into whatever the Lord has for us, that we would learn to breathe in and out this pure and precious grace of God. That we would receive it for ourselves and exhale it to others. That we might know this grace. And before I give you the benediction, just remind you that there's a sermon card on the table out back. Please pick up a, cop, a couple of copies of those if you like and pray and ready your heart as we hear God's word from time to time. And if you want to keep chewing on God's word at 3 o'clock this afternoon, we have our um, sermon Q&A. And so if you've got questions from this morning's sermon or Esther chapter 1, uh, join us at 3 o'clock on Zoom. And uh, we'll just take Q&A for about an hour and uh, push God's word deeper into our hearts that way. Amen? And now the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless, family.